everyone, and welcome once again to the Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words, where every show I talk to writers from across the literary spectrum about their work and how they do what they do. Uh, sometimes it's a huge New York Times bestseller. Other times it might be somebody just starting to get their work out there. But wherever my guest is on, on the literary spectrum, uh, they are here to share some information about that work and to help you learn something about the publishing industry and, again, how they do what they do. Um, for those who don't know, the show is available both on YouTube and uh, via podcast on all of the usual platforms, including iTunes and iHeart and uh, Audible, etc. So um, if podcasts are your thing, go to your favorite platform and search out the open mic writers in their own words, and you can find us there. Do me a solid, subscribe, leave me a good review, and um, that will help other people find the show, which is what we really want to do is uh, have as many eyeballs and ears on my guests as we can possibly get. Um, and along those lines, I'm joined today by the fabulous Stephen Mac Jones, who is a published poet and playwright and the man behind the really outstanding August Snow crime fiction series. Um, I had the great pleasure of meeting him recently at the Long Beach Men of Mystery Festival, where he was a panelist and I was a moderator for a different panel. Um, but I very quickly have become just a huge fan of his work, because I can tell you, the uh, as I noted, the August Snow series is just outstanding. So, and, you know, from everything I can tell, Steve, you're a really interesting guy as well. So, uh, without further ado, uh, Steve, welcome to the open mic. Thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, and honestly, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> well, well, well let's, at least let's, that's what my friends say. You know. Well, you know what? Our friends are sometimes our our harshest critics. So we're gonna we're gonna, we're just gonna go with we're gonna go with that. You're an interesting guy. <laughs> Anyway, let's let's get to it. We'll let the audience decide if either one of us are worth paying any attention to today. We'll start there. Um, so I've mentioned the August Snow books, uh, like I said, and I'm I'm thrilled when I discover something new because you know I read a lot of crime fiction, obviously, because most of my guests, though I say, will, will come from across the spectrum. A lot of the folks I speak with here on the on the podcast and the uh, YouTube show are from the crime fiction realm, and I don't always find anything that's that. Uh, groundbreaking or different. So when I find something, I really enjoy it a lot. And and I will say uh, the August Snow series is, is really, really good. I um, You don't see Thank too you. many things said in Detroit. Um, I love the fact, uh, I, I love, well, we'll get into the characters here in just a bit. I'll ask you some questions about that. I'll just say August is a really, really interesting character. So rather than me going on and on, for anybody who might not be familiar with the series yet, uh, give us a brief rundown, if you will, on August Snow and his background uh, as a character in your series. All right. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, really appreciate it. And fun was had at uh, the Men of Mystery uh, meeting in California. Uh, August Snow, um, in brief, is um, half Mexican-American, half African-American and makes his home in a section of Detroit called Mexican Town. It's really Southwest Detroit, but it's been known for decades as uh, Mexican Town. Uh, he lives in the home that um, he was raised in. Uh, August is a former Marine and ex-Detroit cop. He became an ex-Detroit cop uh, by investigating uh, the mayor's office for malfeasance. Uh, well, that's hard to believe in Detroit, isn't it? <laughs> well, I will add one thing. I'm a political reporter by trade, and so I'm quite ah. familiar with your 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 the former mayor you're probably referencing. I and and, and your former governor probably referencing. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> a little shadowing of that of uh, whose name shall not be mentioned. But um, he was fired from the Detroit police force um, and he sued for wrongful uh, dismissal and he won uh, a $12 million settlement. 
uh, from the city of Detroit. Uh, and that's, that's a lot of money, but, um, but what is the cost to him personally? Uh, it's not the money that really matters for August because uh, he enjoyed his work and he was good at his work. So he, uh, after the settlement, retreats to his Mexican town neighborhood and is using a good portion of his uh, settlement to revitalize the street that um, the house and the street that he was raised on in Mexican town. And um, that's that's August in brief. He gets he gets. Uh, he would much rather live his life quietly, but somehow um, situations always seem to find him. Um, yes, as, as, as protagonists in these kinds of books often do, but he's, a, he's such a well-rounded character. And I will tell you, it, it got me right away because my father is from Mexico, so I'm half Mexican. My mother is French Canadian. And, um, I, there's several things I, I, I really like about this character, but I'm, I was really drawn to the fact that he, he, he has a fine taste in things like clothes and furniture, uh, alcohol, literature. He's a very well-rounded person, right? He's, yeah. he's, he's uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? He's somewhat urbane, even though that was probably, that was not really his background. And you don't think of that maybe in the in this genre, but he is. He's extraordinarily well read. He understands, you know, whether it's literature, cooking, which I love to cook, so I'm 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 loving the descriptions and his his uh, affinity for good food and good alcohol. I love bourbon, but he's also a man of extreme violence when the situation calls for it, and with yeah. him, it calls for it quite a bit. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just curious, was there, you know, when you were developing this character, what were the seeds of this character for you? I mean, I've, I've talked with a lot of writers who say, you know, maybe they had literally had a voice start appearing in their head or something along mm -hmm. those lines, or there was some other inspiration, or maybe it was just something I haven't seen before and I want this character to be like this. What, yeah. what was it for you in creating this really memorable character? Well, it, it may sound a bit odd, but uh, August is essentially a tribute to uh, my mother and father. Um, my mother is, uh, by the way, she's going on her 97th birthday, so good on you. Um, she knew art. She knows art. She knows literature. Uh, she, um, she appreciates um, those things. And to the point of when my brother and I were younger, uh, she would actually physically place us in front of the TV whenever there was a Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concert. On, um, which, which was wonderful. Um, my father, um, hard guy, tough guy, uh, loving guy, uh, blue collar, uh, Oldsmobile uh, worker for close to 40 years. Um, he was uh, essentially the reader in the family. He knew um, books. Uh, he was, uh, let's put it this way, uh, after, um, after 50 years um, of being a subscriber to the Wall Street Journal, uh, the first day he missed an issue was the day that he passed away. Uh, and this from a guy who quit school in uh, ninth grade, 10th grade, so that he could work and bring money home to his family. So uh, in a way, um, 
August is an amalgamation of my parents and his folks who are deceased um, are reflections again of, of my folks, my upbringing, um, honor, integrity, and arts. And you meant, you know, you weave a lot of that in to uh, the storyline and uh, you, you really are a great writer, Steve. If I haven't mentioned that <laughs> to folks, you might not have picked that up. The man can write it really, really. Uh, Thank you so funny. much, Rich. Oh, uh, you know, here, the one thing I don't do to anyone, I don't BS anybody about anything, especially <laughs> with writing stuff. And I will tell you, you're, <laughs> you're really, really good. I, I seriously cannot hardly put this book down. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on some things with with um, cars, et cetera, and a few other things along those lines. But I, I want to ask you too, because I understand that, and I don't know if it's a whole series or just the latest book, but I thought it was just the latest book, Dead of Winter, had been option for uh, film or TV. Is that correct? Did I, do I have that correct? Uh, you do have it correct. Um, it's been under option. Uh, the series has been under option for um, uh, about five years, six years. Uh, I don't know if that option will continue. Um, right now it's with um, CBS Studios and um, Imagine Studios, which is Ron Howard and his partners. Um, and the main figure behind um, the acquisition is uh, Keegan Michael Key of uh, right, right, right. Key and Peel uh, fame. And he's attached as an executive producer and the lead for August Snow. Um, I don't know from day to day, week to week, month to month where it's going because um, I'm in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a long way from Hollywood. Um, Let me tell well, you, I used to live in LA. You, you anywhere that's not in Hollywood is a long way from Hollywood. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we might as well be talking about you know the, the land of Oz. Right. Um, true statement. But um, all I can say is we'll see. In the meantime. I'm still sitting in my chair making stuff up. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, a lot of the folks uh, that have come on the show have had their stuff option and, and a few have had their stuff made into movies. Uh, Peter Abrahams has been on the show a few times. His, his book, yeah, yeah. The Fan, was turned into uh, a movie. Uh, my good friend, Jeff Perlman, who was just on his book about the 1980s Lakers is the, the um, HBO series Showtime. Um, he's oh, the author. Yes. yes. Um, so, you know, several, but I've talked to many, many more who had their books optioned over and over, never had them be made. Some have been attached to big stars and they still didn't get made. It's a right. very, I, it sounds to me like you have the right perspective, which is, you know, we've done the deal and now I, there's not much I can do except just do what I do. Because right. I, I think so many times when people get into this, they think they hear those things and they think that's a ticket. That's the golden ticket that will never stop giving, but it's a very tenuous thing, right? Right, uh, and don't get me wrong. It's it's uh, having your work optioned is a blessing. It's a mitzvah, um, but it's it's not something that you hold your breath over. Um, you express your gratitude and move on, um, and let the powers that be do what they will do. I, Detroit is a really big part of this series too. And I've had the good fortune in my life. I've been able to do some traveling around the country. I've The only time I've been in Detroit was in the airport. Um, I have honestly never been, and I've always wanted to actually wanted to go, but I have never been there. And so I'm reading it, uh, and trying to absorb this as as I go too, and so it's really like a character unto itself. You you do again such a great job of weaving in 
the visuals of, of for, for somebody like me who's only able to imagine it and not recall it. I know you're a Michigan native, um, so it's maybe it was a natural to set there, but tell me a little bit about Detroit as a character in these in your series and and what it means for uh, for this backdrop. Well, uh, Detroit is uh, just briefly. It, Detroit is like a boxer uh, who's you know been beaten and bloodied and has gone to the mat, um, but never really for the full ten count. Uh, Detroit is a city that that keeps getting up off the mat and and. Uh, saying to all challenges and challengers, what else you got? Um, it's a very tough city. It's a city that um, will one minute knock you down in an instance. And in the next, it will raise you up on its shoulders. Um, it's, it's a good city. Um, it is a warm city, um, save for the months of December through February. Um, but it's also a city that, that um, knows real stuff from BS. Um, uh, tough times have been a good teacher uh, to this city. And um, it's a city that most people, and, and including Hollywood, has, has reduced to um, certain stereotypes. Right. And, um, you know, I, I really don't see those stereotypes do exist. Um, but not in the abundance, not in the the shorthand that uh, most people are given. Um, well, I, I think many of us of us, uh, you know, and I'm 59, so I'm not a kid by any stretch of the imagination. But I think younger people in particular, that's all they think of Detroit. Yes, and we're we don't really have the the mindset anymore that at one time, Detroit was one of the most cosmopolitan and wealthiest cities in the world uh, with thriving art and thriving uh, industry well beyond the auto industry uh, with shipping yeah. and all of the other uh, aspects of a growing America in the late uh, 19th and early, uh, all the way into the mid 20th century. And it was a uh, my wife's uh, one of my wife's grandparents is from Detroit. And, and so, you know, we've had a little thought about it to some extent, you know, and I, it is a shame to, to that we don't think of it in that way that we think of it only as like, as you point out, you know, something like out of uh, a John Carpenter movie. Right. Right. Um, the apocalyptic landscape, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, the truth of the matter is uh, Detroit is a, very diverse city, um, ethnically, racially, um, religiously. Um, it's it's extraordinarily diverse, and that diversity um, can actually be enjoyed in um, a variety of restaurants. Uh, you want high French cuisine? You can find that here. Um, do you want great Italian, great Greek food, um, Middle Eastern food? You can find it here. Um, great, you know, Chinese and Japanese food. Um, all of those uh, ethnicities, all of those people from around the world have settled here. Uh, have made their livelihoods here and continue to take pride in living here um, and enjoying each other's company. Uh, one thing that 
a lot of people don't really know about Detroit is this is the city that people are referring to throughout the country and throughout the world as the center of arts. Um, people are moving here, photographers, painters, uh, sculptors. Um, they continue to move here. And it's a very supportive city uh, for the arts. I know I've benefited from uh, Detroit's support of the arts. Well, that's fabulous. Um, I, I'm curious as to maybe, and maybe you can't talk about it, maybe you can't, but the future for August Snow. Um, I thought I'd read somewhere that maybe you'd, you'd only plan to do one more book and then you were going to move on to something else. Is that true? What, what Are you able to talk about whatever your long-term plans are for this series? Listen, Rich, you got a minute. <laughs> uh, uh, after the first book was published, I thought, wow, I can die happy. This is, this is wonderful. After, after X many years in advertising, marketing, communications, I'm writing something for myself and there are people that want to read it. I could, I could die in that moment. And the only reason I gave thought to a second book was because um, my publisher, Soho Press, maker of fine literature. <laughs> Sorry, I, I get five bucks every time I say that. <laughs> um, they started after August Snow was published. Um, the folks at Soho started calling me. And I, I found it nice that they did, but it was unusual. Um, and these calls usually ended with, um, so Steve, how's the second book coming? I, I had no intentions. Um, I, was, I was happy just to have this out in the world. So naturally I told them, uh, second book is going great. I hadn't written a word. <laughs> So uh, the truth is, I, uh, you know, the three books that are in the series now and, and the new book that will be coming in um, 2023, uh, I've never seen beyond each book. Uh, so the short answer is, I don't know. It, uh, the adventure may continue, uh, or I may take a divergent path. So, I'm guessing if 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 uh, Keegan Michael Key gets this thing into production uh, as a series or something, uh, you know, uh, especially on something like Netflix or something where there's a huge audience, you you might get a lot of pressure to keep writing books. Um, that could very well be, but. <laughs> Right now, that's a theory that yeah, yeah. remains to be tested. Well, one step at a time, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So let me talk a bit about process because that's that is one of my big focuses here is process. So, um, and this is something that came up at Men of Mystery, which if you're in the Southern California area next year around October, I highly recommend you go to because there's some really great folks there that come and, and do share yeah. good information. I highly recommend it. Um, but let's talk about process for a minute, because one of the things that every writer struggles with is getting an idea onto the page and getting it to completion. And, you know, people just because of me doing things like this, they'll ask me, oh, hey, you know, I've thought about writing a book and, you know, any advice. And I always say you cannot edit what you haven't written. Get it. you got to just barf out that first draft. Whatever right, it right, takes, get right. to the end. And then accept that that's a hot mess and it's not going to look like anything after you've edited many times. Yeah. I know you were asked about this mystery. I wanted you to share with my audience. 
You know, what is your uh, perspective on what your first drafts look like compared to your final ones? Oh, their their first drafts are always crap. <laughs> it's it's oh it it's 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 third grade stuff. Um, but the joy is actually finishing the first draft. Uh, knowing that that it looks like you know Frankenstein's monster, um, but finishing that first draft is an achievement. It's almost it's almost um, a way of charting the path to the second and third draft and. Really, for for me, Rich, the the art side of writing a book um, is the first and second draft. That's the art, just just getting it out there. Mm-hmm. Craft comes with um, editing and and revising and and uh, exploring new ideas uh, within that draft framework. So, yeah. Um, I ask all, pretty much everyone that comes on the show this question. Are, do you generally start with characters or with plot? Uh, I mean, do you have characters in your head and then you devise a plot for them or does a, or do you generally have a plot? Now, of course, now you, you have recurring characters, but in the beginning, was it always the character that came first and you figured out something for them to do or is it, or is it the other way around? Well, um, or me, it, it always begins with what if, um, you know, uh, two or three sentences that are essentially, what if this happened? Um, and who are who are the people that populate this what if scenario? Um, it's it's really just a lot of of time thinking about uh, the what if. Um, and who can bring the what if to life? Um, so once once I have um, that what if um, and start refining that, um, then it's an exploration of of who can populate this idea. Um, what warm-blooded, real person um, will live in this little universe uh, and make make the what if come to life. Do you outline or or are you one of the seat of the pants types? Boy, um... There are times when um, I'm both. More than not, Rich, I, I am both. Um, I will outline and then proceed to lose those notes. Um, and then uh, just digging in um, with a scene or um a bit of dialogue, not knowing exactly uh, where it fits in, but something to give me a sense of uh, the validity of this idea. Um, now, let me ask you just to follow on that because I, yeah. I know my own, because I do the same thing. And I've tried pure seat of the pants and it didn't work. I've tried doing detailed outline and that doesn't work. What I did find out was a a not uh, super thorough outline, but one enough to give me framework. Yes. But then when I get into it, 
having the freedom to deviate from that and go with an idea that is working better than what I outlined. Is that maybe what you're talking about? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I have tried, and, and nothing against this for the folks out there that do this, uh, but I have tried doing uh, detailed outlines, like uh, 20, 30 page outlines of the story. And, and for me, um, that becomes more of a science project than a storytelling project. Um, it becomes an algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm, yeah, I, I fluctuate between uh, taking notes as far as what I'd like to happen, uh, what I would like uh, said by a certain character, and then as the story develops, as, as the chapters come, abiding by those notes or seeing that the story is moving through those notes to something more organic, if that, if, if that makes sense. Oh, it totally makes sense. Um, one, one other leg of that stool there for me is, <clears throat> as a reader has always been dialogue. And I can, I can hang a little bit with a plot that doesn't terribly interest me. Um, for me, I, I, I'm far more attracted to characters, though I'm, believe me, I'm not saying your plot isn't good because your plotting is fabulous. Um, I'm drawn to characters, but really I think what draws me to characters and the, and the, the characters maybe at the capital C is dialogue because stilted dialogue, which I, I do see sometimes, will turn me off to a book faster than anything else or a, or a short story, anything. I don't, it just doesn't resonate with me. But when dialogue is good, and when, because then I can hear that person in my head, I can read it. And it's like, I'm sitting there with them observing this because it feels very, very real. You have a fine ear with dialogue. And because your characters, now you have some who are native Detroit, you have some from, you know, the who are not uh, uh, Native Americans and what I'm, I mean, people from America. Um, yes. And it all feels very real. I can hear that and I can see those people through that dialogue, through the way they speak. Give me a little of your perspective on writing dialogue. Was that hard for you did you have to put a lot of thought into it what's your thoughts around writing dialogue um i like to listen um listening to people um and and um the uh, empathizing with with uh people of different backgrounds uh, and knowing that, um, appreciating the fact that personality uh, isn't something that uh, you're necessarily born with. It's something that is developed over um, your personal experiences, um, how you move, how you speak, your confidence, your lack of confidence. Um, having an ear um, to the way different people express their personality through words. Um, and trying to be um, uh, respectful of those differences, um, even if it's, even if you're writing, uh, a bad guy that you want, uh, you know, everybody to hate. Um, well, I, I, what I like is, as far as dialogue for villains, is um, making sure that there is some flesh and blood uh, behind those, uh, behind that villainy. Um, that there is an origin story. Um, 
that people aren't necessarily born bad, um, but certain situations impact um, their behavior and their manner of speech, um, the way they listen, the way they talk, uh, what's behind their words. Um, so yes, um, yeah, dialogue, dialogue is a part of bringing separate and diverse um, personalities out. Um, let me, let me, and one follow up on that, because you're also a published poet. And I wasn't really going to ask you about poetry, but it makes me think as you talk about this, poetry is a lot of the ear uh, to, you know, to, to bring emotion, visualization uh, to, to the reader. And all poetry has, has a voice to it. Yes. Did that uh, how joined are those, I guess, your, your, your poetry and writing in crime fiction? I know they seem like they're on polar opposite ends of the scale there, but um, it sounds like you're talking about them in the very same way. Yes, yes. Um, I, the most valuable thing I've, I've learned and continue to learn from uh, reading poetry um, is the value of every word that is given, uh, the weight and color and uh, smell and feel of each word that is selected. Um, the the reading of poetry for me has taught me about the economy of words and uh, how vivid images can be brought to life with four, five, six words, uh, one, two, or three stanzas. Um, yeah, uh, poetry has been a, a, an important teacher for me. For a long time, the publishing industry was really not all that receptive to writers of color and particularly in the crime and mystery genres. The industry has changed a lot in general over the last 20 years or so. Um, how, how do you see the landscape now for writers of color and particularly in crime and, and mystery and thriller? Has it got better? Has it stayed the same? Is it worse? I, I frankly think that even though the past um, seven years have seven or eight years has been uh, contentious at best, uh, both uh, societally and and within the publishing industry. I frankly think we are in a golden age of new voices. Um, I, I think, uh, and, and honestly, Rich, I have to give credit where credit is due. I think a lot of that is, is due to writers like um, Kelly Garrett um, and, and Walter Mosley and, and uh, yes, absolutely. Um, those those are folks who have have boldly lent their voice to um, to the ear of publishing, and I think um, uh, with with folks like um, Sean Cosby, S. A. Cosby, um, we we have certainly entered 
um, a golden age of listening to uh, other people, other voices, uh, Sujata Massey, um, uh, Naomi Hirahara. Um, people, I think what the publishing industry has learned, uh, and this, this may sound crass, but um, I think the publishing industry has learned they can make money from publishing writers of color, um, people from uh, voices from around the world that have not been heard. Um, but yeah, I think publishing companies have learned they can make a buck or two because- Which is always the bottom line, right? When they when they figure out they can make money- I'm afraid so. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid so. Um, it has very little to do with benevolence. Um, it has everything to do with um, marketing communications, advertising, and um, assessing what readers want. And readers, I, I believe the publishing industry has discovered that readers want to hear other voices. Absolutely. Um, they want to discover um, other cultures. Um, it's, it's exciting. Uh, it's awakening. Um, and it's, it's vital in today's world. You know, I had J.A. Jantz on the show um, back when we were still just a blog. And, and you know, uh, and she's probably, you've probably heard this story before, but, you know, she talked about before her first book, the reason that all her books are under the name J.A., because anyone who knows her knows to call her Judy, is because her publisher told her, well, men, men are the biggest audience for mysteries, and men won't read a, a mystery written by a woman. And so she had to use her initials. And, and that was a long time ago, clearly, you know, I think it was sometime in the eighties or something, which does well, that's not that long ago, long enough, I'll just say, but it, it really does um, astound me sometimes that that's what it takes, that there, there has to be something that connects dollars to common sense with industry, whatever the industry is, right? Yeah. It doesn't really yeah. matter. It could be publishing, it could be anything, but um, you know, I like to read new read, uh, new voices. I like to read pers different perspectives. And I, I'd like to think I'm a fairly typical reader in that. So I'm, I'm, I love the fact that part of the great joy of doing this particular project is I get to discover all kinds of new writers yes. that I would not mm -hmm. have probably got to know before through some way or another. You mentioned uh, S.A. Cosby, and I actually had a question about that. Because I was thinking of yourself and him from the perspective, I grew up a car guy. My, my first couple of decades in the working world, I was in the autom automotive business. I was a technician. Oh, and, and oh really? I grew up a real muscle car guy. So part, part of the joy in reading August is I'm, I'm, every time he gets into that 442, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a 66 SS Chevelle 396 oh, with a big block. You know, big block 396 and oh, a, a rock pressure and a 411 rear end, right? I'm all my I'm one of my best friends in the world had a beautiful 55 Bel Air two door with a with a 327. You know, I'm going on all the car yeah. talk and all the people will, will that don't care about cars will tune out. I'm saying I'm a car guy, so I'm reading this going, I like this. Same thing when I've read when I read essays stuff, right? And it struck, it strikes me because that's another thing with with writers of color you just it seems like that aspect of the culture has been ignored for a long time i've known a lot of people of color who are into the cars right who are into muscle oh, yeah. but yes. that has always been so presented as strictly you know it's the it's the dukes of hazard stuff right the only people right. who could possibly appreciate a detroit made muscle car 
from a certain era has got to be, you know, a, a, a white guy in his 20s from the South. And that's just such <laughs> horse shit, right? It drives me crazy. So as I as I was reading August, uh, you know, um, Dead of Winter, I'm going, I love this, man. I love the fact he's 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 got this 442 that he really, uh, you know, I can visualize in my head really so clearly. <laughs> so I don't know. Do you, I'm not even sure I have a question necessarily on that other than I noticed it. And, and was that a, a really intentional thing for you to bring that out? That was, yeah, that was, that was very intentional. Um, and again, it goes back to um, the way I was raised. Uh, I might've mentioned that my father worked for close to 40 years at the Oldsmobile plant. Uh, in Lansing, he worked on the 442. Um, I remember my brother and I going to the Oldsmobile parking lot uh, where they kept the new cars until uh, the trains and trucks came to take them away and seeing row upon row uh, and color upon color of 442s. Uh, which still to this day is, is, and I'm, I'm not so much a car guy, but when I start talking about it, I start feeling that excitement of having been around it. Um, 442 was a, um, it was a brilliant car. Mm -hmm. It was, it was just beautiful it was it was both sculpture and muscle um and and yeah um the people that worked on those cars were the people that loved those cars and that love was spread across uh white people black people brown people red people um, and I've, I've walked through, um, the Oldsmobile plant where my father worked uh, right up until, um, they shuttered that brand. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that, that love is spread across the field. Well, I, I guess, again, as a reader, I really appreciated that because, it, again, it reminded me of something I actually had familiarity with myself, right? Which is, right. I think, one of the real values of having a, 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 this diversity among authors, right? Because otherwise, you're presuming all the readers also have only that same cultural history. Yes. And we don't. Yes. We do not have the same cultural history. Right. And as a reader, I I would like to see more of a of a spectrum that looks like my own cultural history or at least something I can relate to. And I, I personally don't relate to being a white guy from Alabama. I, no, no, no offense to anybody in Alabama. I don't, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I, I actually have a lot of history with a lot of folks of color and, and cars and all these things. And I never saw that represented the way you and, and S.A. Cosby do um in in the modern in modern literature so anyway it just struck me a little bit when i saw it i said oh you know that's really cool i like i like that i love that he's into that to a muscle well it's it's i think i think uh, you know avid readers read um i don't think i don't think anybody who is an avid reader makes distinctions as to what the author looks like. They may make distinctions as to, well, I'm, I'm not much of a science fiction person. Um, I like crime novels, or I don't like crime novels. I like autobiographies. Um, the writer's color rarely, if ever, comes up with an avid reader. And there are plenty of avid readers out there. Mm -hmm. um, who frankly just don't give a damn uh, what the author looks like. Um, give me a good story. Right. Uh, tell me something I didn't know before. Absolutely. Um, 
I only have two more, and this is the last serious one. Um, tell me about the feeling of hitting the end when you're, whether it's a first draft or the final draft. What is the feeling that you get when you type those two words? Is it relief? Is it exhilaration? You know, longing? I mean, do you need a good bourbon after? What What is the feeling after typing the end for you? Rich, do you do you remember um, watching some of the whether you stream them or what have you? Uh, watching some of the old nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties science fiction movies, black and white science fiction. Movies, oh yeah, oh yeah. Where uh, you know, across the screen after after ninety minutes, one hundred and twenty minutes they say the end and then a question mark appears oh is this really the end for that monster that that <laughs> shit oh i better prepare myself for the next next feature um that's that's pretty much the feeling i get um when i type the end question mark or is it? <laughs> and the only way that is ever resolved for me is when my editor says, yeah, yeah, Steve, it, it's, it's the end. Okay, stop. Yeah. That, that, we're good. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So the question mark comes to <laughs> yeah. Now it goes to an exclamation mark. Right? Exactly. <laughs> well, I like to end... And and just you know to be real straight here, I could I could keep asking you questions about writing all day long, but I'm gonna I'm gonna make myself stop here, you know, <laughs> for your benefit and mine. Um, but I like to end on a fun question, I and mean, I mean for it to be a fun question, so I hope it is. So um, format's always the same. I'm gonna give you three options here. Well, let's just say I am the omnipotent power that it can put you together with any one of these three people for whatever you want, a, a drink, dinner, conversation, I don't care, dancing, whatever, whatever, whatever makes your boat go. But you're gonna only choose one. And the three options I'm gonna give you are all Detroit icons. Uh, we're gonna start with Barry Sanders, great running back of the, of the Detroit Lions. Mm -hmm. The wonderful Martha Reeves, or Art Clokey, who, for those of you who don't know, a Detroit uh, native who was the creator of Pokey and Gumby. A staple of my, of my youth. Steve, those are your options. Who would you choose to have to sit down and have that conversation with if I could put you together with them? That is a tough one. Uh, let, me, let me ask somebody off camera, my, my boss, uh, my wife. Who who do you what? Okay, who would I spend uh, like this? Barry Sanders, um, Martha Reeves, or the guy who created Pokey and Gumby? I'm I'm leaning towards Pokey, Pokey and Gumby. Gumby. <laughs> yeah, I'm. You know, I, yeah, I love Barry Sanders. I I really do. I I've met him a couple of times. Um, just a genuinely nice person. Uh, Martha Reeves, I've, I've never met, but um, I love what, uh, her music. Mm -hmm. You'd have more to talk about with Pokey and Gumby. I, I got to go with Pokey and Gumby. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, yeah, w were you doing mushrooms or? <laughs> yeah. What, what, what was going on, man? <laughs> it can't can't argue the logic. I mean, I think if it was my choice, I would be thinking that too. It's like Pokey and Gumby. What in the world, man? A yeah. talking claymation horse and a and a and and what in the hell is Gumby? What is that? An eraser? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. What is that's the question I'd want to ask. What the, I get it, you know, Pokey's a horse. What is Gumby? Right, right. And did you get any residuals from Eddie Murphy? 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Did you did he did he do you the solid of contact? <laughs> what do you think about my 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 gumby on uh, SNL? Come on, man. Well, Steve, this has been fabulous. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, today to come and share all these insights into your work and the process of your work. Um, I'm genuine when I say uh, to the audience out there, if you haven't discovered Stephen Mac Jones, I highly recommend his work. Uh, you, you, dude, you're a great writer. As simple as that. I don't Thank know what else to so say. Much. You're a great writer. And you're a good guy. Uh, I really uh, I say I appreciate you coming on and I, I wish you all the success in the world. I hope Keegan Michael Key gets that thing in production because uh, I will be sitting there with uh, with my wife and my and whoever else I can talk into it. We'll be sitting there watching it. So from your lips to God's ears. So. Hey, you know what? Uh, it's never worked before, so I don't want I don't want to jinx that. You know, I'll just I'll just say I hope somebody smarter than me, you know, does does what they're supposed to do. Right. Um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you again, Stephen. I appreciate it. Um, Rich, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great. great well, enjoy it. Appreciate that, too. And, you know, let me know uh, when the next time the, the new book comes out next year, you uh, drop me in line. We'll, we'll have you back on to talk about it. And we'll, we'll hopefully we'll uh, help more folks discover you as they as they go along, as they should. Um, until then. Uh, for all of those of you out there, uh, I'll remind you again, if you haven't hit subscribe, do so, because every episode I bring some really smart person like Stephen on the, the show to talk about writing. And uh, you know what? It's a lot cheaper than going to the bookstore and buying all those craft books. So you might as well just uh, hit subscribe and give me a nice review and help other people find us. And uh, I'll just keep doing this because I don't make any money doing it. I do it because, uh, you know what? I love writers. I love reading and uh, I hope you do too. The last thing I will leave you with is the same thing I leave you with every time. Tomorrow is not promised to any of us. So please make today count. Until then, this has been Rich Eisen for my guest, Stephen Mac Jones. This has been the open mic, writers in their own words. And we will see you next time. Thanks.